Good morning. God bless you on this great uh, Pentecost Sunday as we are um, celebrating and honoring uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit at the uh, birthday of the church. So we can say happy birthday church today too. The, the Spirit as the, uh, the powerful mover to uh, start new things. In fact, the Holy Spirit didn't just show up in uh, Acts chapter 2. He showed up in uh, uh, the second verse of the Bible. And there's a, a long uh, history of the Holy Spirit's action in the Old Testament as well. Uh, but with, the, you know, with great power, uh, the Holy Spirit filled the 120 women and men that were gathered in prayer um, in that upper room and uh, were each one empowered to represent God, to uh, minister the truth of the gospel on the streets of Jerusalem, and to do so in languages that everyone could understand. Uh, people from, I think, 13 different uh, countries were in Jerusalem at the time, because, you know, Pentecost was already a, a holiday in the uh, Jewish tradition. It's mentioned in the Old Testament several times, because it's the celebration of the giving of the Ten Commandments. Uh, God uh, descended on the uh, mountain uh, called uh, Sinai and uh, spoke to the people of Israel to empower them. And, and explicitly God says, I want you to become a nation of priests so that you, everyone knows me and everyone can then represent me to one another in your families. Children represent God to their parents. Parents represent God to their children, neighbors to one another, cousins, uncles, nephews, nieces. Um, unfortunately, the children of Israel kind of dropped the ball on that. And uh, so we have with Pentecost, the, uh, as, as we celebrate Pentecost, uh, the opportunity for anyone, everyone in the world to receive God's grace, be born again, and uh, to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit so that God's presence uh, dwells uh, within us. Now the Spirit gives life. And this is why the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the very second verse of Scripture. Uh, it says, uh, well, everything was without form and empty. I uh, was you know, ready for God's uh, work of creation, for God's uh, saying, let there be light. Uh, perhaps the, the Big Bang but it says the Holy Spirit hovered over all the, all the fluids, just uh, re eager, ready to uh, be given form and shape. Um, so the Holy Spirit is there at the very beginning. And the, and the word spirit uh, in the Hebrew language, which is the language that the Old Testament was written in in the first place, yeah, the word for spirit is ruach. You kind of clear your throat at the end of that word, ruach. And uh, the spirit uh, is mentioned the second time in chapter 2 of uh, Genesis. So second verse, and then second chapter, seventh verse. It says that God uh, uh, shaped some dirt, uh, formed it, and that dirt, that clay may have been uh, somewhat organic, we don't know what it was, uh, what it contained, but God shaped some dirt from the earth, and it says he breathed into it the ruach of life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life, and what God breathed into us, God, as he instructed Moses to write uh, Genesis, uh, selects the, the very word used to uh, uh, speak of the Holy Spirit, so that uh, we are as God's creation. In according to Genesis 1, we are God's image, God's children, God's representative on earth, God's likeness, and then chapter 2 goes in a sense deeper to say that, that uh, we have, we have um, the Spirit of God that, that gives life and meaning to our lives. We, we can show comparisons between human bodies and some animals, 
Um, but the absolute difference uh, that distinguishes us completely from the animal kingdom is that we have the spirit. And to become born again is to be renewed in the spirit, to have the spirit re enter, redwell into our, our bodies. And our bodies, the Bible teaches us, are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So we are uh, the Holy Spirit on, on legs. So the, the Spirit is mentioned very powerfully right at the very beginning. And uh, the Pentecost is in a way a renewal of the beginning. This is another new start. In fact, that new start happened about 30 years before that when the Spirit, when Ruach planted the seed of new humanity inside of Mary. So that the beginning of Jesus' ministry is also marked by action of the Spirit, 30 some years, 32, 33 years before Pentecost. And, and the idea of being born again, to be part of the new humanity in Jesus, that idea was made possible, was empowered, was uh, open to all of us because of the miracle of Christmas, where the Holy Spirit, nine months before Christmas, nine months before uh, uh, started the new humanity within Mary. And Mary had this extraordinary uh, ministry of carrying the Son of God, carrying the Savior within her as, as baby Jesus developed over those months and then to be revealed to the world on that great Christmas day. So the, the big holidays always have something to do with the Holy Spirit. And... Um, even uh, the resurrection, it says it was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, it, it has to be said that the uh, Trinity is a mystery, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it doesn't hurt to give some clarity to that ministry. When we reference God the Father, it's always in reference to the, the one who runs all the universes, God as the absolute creator, absolute sovereign of all the universes. And, and yet at the same time, God has this special interest in humanity, the humanity that is his image, the humanity that's his likeness, humanity that's uh, his stewards. We are his stewards on earth, and the humanity that exists and, and functions and thinks and worships and creates because we have the Ruach, we have the spirit that was blown into us uh, when we were just hunks of clay. Um, so, so we have this uh, amazing affirmation of God the Father, and then God the, the, God the Son is the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He's the, the doer, the one that relates to us as a, a person experiencing life and demonstrating life in obedience to God. Thy will be done, not only being taught by Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, but acted by Jesus at the garden scene where Jesus uh, affirms his role to suffer for us, to die for us. Thy will be done. But Jesus is the doer, the actor, the ultimate one obedient to God's will because he is God in human form. He is human, uh, full of God's presence, complete God in the presence of uh, Jesus. But the Holy Spirit has been in nature, has been in uh, uh, human nature right from the beginning, and the Holy Spirit uh, seeks to really be released and empowered within us, and that uh, the, what happened at the beginning of time, what happened at the beginning of Jesus' life uh, is huge, is significant. And, and reminds us that if we want that new life, we want to live out the new humanity, we are willing to be different by being born again, we receive the complete work of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit uh, make us complete into the uh, new humanity. And as the Spirit uh, descended on Jesus too, uh, three years or so before Pentecost, descended on Jesus and drove him into the wilderness for 
time of severe testing, that that, that same spirit can, uh, and in the same way, guide our lives and direct our lives. Now, what is also amazing is that the very first sermon Jesus preached started, the whole sermon started with the word spirit. Isn't that amazing? So Jesus says in his first sermon in the, the synagogue of uh, Nazareth where he grew up, uh, that, that the Spirit has anointed me. And he's quoting from Isaiah, but he's making an extraordinary claim that helps us define and understand the leadership of the Spirit. So the Spirit has, uh, has descended on me. The Spirit has defined me to proclaim the gospel, to liberate people that are oppressed, to empower uh, those that are captive of others. Uh, so that the idea of the Spirit's leadership in Jesus' life from Isaiah's prophecy and uh, spoken very clearly by the Lord in his first sermon is liberation, liberty. A great concept, a great experience. And we uh, Americans are thrilled to uh, celebrate liberty, to uh, talk about our liberties, to have our, our Bill of Rights, to uh, uh, state a very important liberties that we have. And uh, the temptation may be sometimes to think of them as America's invention or ideas that are uh, rooted in American history, but they go way, way back before that. The ideas of liberty are taught, first of all, in the Bible. I was asked uh, a couple of years ago to uh, go to a secret meeting of uh, government leaders from a Mideastern country. Uh, these leaders were gathered at the UN, and there were uh, two dozen leaders from this Mideastern country, and I was asked never to identify what country. So. I'm uh, living up to that request this morning. But a country that uh, is around 99% Muslim, and that covers quite a few uh, country choices. Um, and they wanted to know ahead of time, they said, uh, just tell us how you as an evangelical Christian, how you could be for liberty when, when in fact, uh, if you think you have the truth, why don't you just make everyone agree with your truth, why is there liberty? And I was excited to be able to uh, go to this meeting. And, and interestingly enough, the night before the meeting in this uh, uh, kind of secret place at the UN, I uh, got a phone call from the leader and he said, by the way, do you mind if a Muslim leader comes and joins you on the panel and the Muslim leader can talk about the role of liberty in Islam. I said, fine. And they identified the name of the Muslim uh, uh, leader, uh, someone who I'd had a couple of encounters with uh, before, and uh, I mentioned it to, uh, to Vicky, and I said, she, she probably doesn't even remember me. And Vicky said, no, I think she probably will. So anyway, so I'm at the meeting, the, uh, this Muslim leader has, uh, doesn't uh, show up on time, and so I was asked to get started. Well, I had created a chart of 13 places in the Bible where liberty and life are both talked about and rooted in the Spirit, and I had that sheet, and I made some copies for you this morning as well. And uh, so I, I shared this with uh, all these leaders. Everyone got a copy and uh, went through these uh, 13 Bible references, encouraged them to uh, get a Bible to read the full context, but really starting with uh, Genesis 1 and, and going, uh, half of these uh, texts are from the uh, New Testament too, and making big reference to Jesus' first sermon, where the Spirit, who is life itself, the word ruach can mean life, how the Spirit was on Jesus, to proclaim liberty to the captives, 
to proclaim uh, freedom to all who are in bondage. And that that defined Jesus' ministry. Freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from oppression, freedom from legalism, freedom to come to know God, freedom to be filled with God's presence in the Spirit. I shared quite a bit uh, with them. and A few minutes into the, the meeting, this Muslim leader uh, shows up in the back of the room, comes in, sees me in the front, and then runs out, runs outside. I thought, wow, maybe she did recognize me. So then she comes back in, and she just looked on the, on the wall. She, she didn't even want to look at me. And, and then came up to the platform to sit next to me, but looking away from me. It was really a quite profound expression of her being uncomfortable in my presence. But um, at any rate, I also shared the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about religious liberty. That was written by a very outspoken, clear-headed Christian leader, uh, Charles Malik, uh, the ambassador from Lebanon, wrote the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights that has this great paragraph that every person in the world should have the right to choose his religion, to teach it, to share it with others, to practice it openly, to uh, teach its uh, scriptures openly. Everybody in the world should have that right. Well, Muslims don't really like that right, so they came up with their own statement of religious uh, liberty. Everybody, and this is their statement from Egypt, where they met to have a contrary document. It's called uh, Egypt, the uh, Cairo Declaration. It says everybody has the right to keep their religion. Uh, Muslims are afraid of uh, allowing their children to explore the gospel, although the fact is more, Muslim, more Muslims have become Christian since 9-11 in the last uh, 17, 18 years than the entire 14 centuries before them. From Muhammad to 9-11, fewer people in that time period left Islam to become uh, Christian than have become Christian in less than uh, 20 years. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but Jesus is very active in the Muslim community with dreams and visions and encouraging others to, uh, uh, encouraging them to find out more about him. And it would help if uh, Muslims knew that they had a Christian working with them at the office or down the street, uh, living down the street. So they would know where to go to know more about Jesus when Jesus shows up in one of these, um, one of these visions. Now, curiously, uh, so I, I handed uh, this uh, Muslim leader a copy of my uh, chart also, which she graciously received. I'm not sure what she did with it, but uh, she graciously received. And so I finished up, I wrapped up, they had some questions, and then she started, and I continued next to her, and I was looking at her, but she refused to even look toward my direction. And the first question of these Muslim leaders is, where, you know, uh, Dr. DeVries has given us 13 places where liberty is strongly taught in the Bible, and he said there are even other places besides these, but these were liberty and life as the two, two core international rights. Uh, where in the Quran are either of these mentioned? And she says, all over the place. The Quran is full of references to liberty and, and uh, the right to liberty and right to life. So they said, well, please give us a quote. And she said, well, I'll, I'll just send it to you in an email. So I handed her my card, and I said, well, please send me an email too with all those quotes from the Quran. I'm still waiting for that email. Uh, because the idea of liberty is, is a very powerful biblical idea. Uh, the idea of empowering people by the Spirit, to empower people to rise above legalism and guilt and manipulation, that every person has dignity, is part of the message of Pentecost, part of the message of creation, part of the message of God breathing His Spirit 
into us. Part of the message of Christmas, where the Holy Spirit started the new humanity in Jesus, part of the message of uh, the Holy Spirit landing on Jesus at his baptism, part of the message of Jesus' first sermon, where he proclaimed that his role was to bring liberty uh, to us. Now, the, the Old Testament concept of jubilee uh, is, uh, uh, is related to this theme of liberty. And every seven years, and then every 50, 50 years, so seven times seven, there were uh, different steps of freeing people from, from debts. There is no biblical justification for slavery, but a person could commit himself to work for another person to pay off a debt, but that, that work had to be over in less than seven years. So you were not owned by a person that was your, your boss or your master. It was not anything like the horrible, uh, really uh, hellish idea of uh, slavery that America practiced for uh, far too many years. So the, uh, uh, the idea of uh, jubilee is uh, rooted in the same gift of liberty. So when Jesus in his first sermon is quoting Isaiah and is speaking himself, he says, this is the year of the Lord. This is the year of liberty. And these are the words used for the, the time of jubilee as well. Just to show you how deeply ingrained the biblical uh, themes of liberty are in, in American uh, practice, uh, 22 years before the Declaration of Independence, which we're going to celebrate again uh, early uh, next month, July 4, but 22 years before 1776, uh, folks in Pennsylvania uh, cast a, a beautiful bell and had it cast onto the bell, not written on later, but part of the actual casting. So this is a very deeply intentional to actually put in the molding of that uh, bell a Bible verse from Leviticus, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. And so the idea of liberty was rooted in uh, American thinking long before the Declaration of Independence. The issue wasn't just liberty from England. The issue was, uh, was spiritual liberty. And the Liberty Bell was created out of the Great Awakening, what's called the First Great Awakening, where people throughout the colonies, so it was primarily people living along the, the uh, 150 miles or so from the, uh, from the ocean where the, uh, the uh, settlements were, but three people throughout all the 13 colonies were really motivated spiritually. They, they would not just pack out churches, they would have to meet in the fields to hear preaching from uh, uh, great preachers like John Wesley or, or Whitfield or um, Asbury, other uh, great preachers. And people were moved to confess their sins and to seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It was a kind of a continuing Pentecost throughout uh, several years in the early 1700s, especially, say, 1730 to 1760, uh, especially in that one expression of that joy in the Lord, one expression of that that. Uh, embracing the Holy Spirit's empowerment, embracing the Holy Spirit's liberty, was to create the Liberty Bell. So while people may go to that and think of the Declaration of Independence and beginning of our Revolutionary War, it actually should be used to remember the message of spiritual awakening in America. Which then reminds us again to what I, I said earlier that the idea of liberty, while in some sense is an American idea, that idea is not invented by America, not having any copyright for America or no patent given to America. That was God's idea right from the beginning. 
that this liberty that we can experience through the Pentecost presence of the Holy Spirit to really receive the full benefit of Jesus' death and resurrection into our lives, to receive, in fact, the very Holy Spirit that made his ministry possible, that made his dying for us possible, that resurrected him from the dead, that same spirit to be filling us as well. So the awesome truth of the Trinity is that the same God that runs all the universes that he created, that same God desires to live within you and within me. The extraordinary power of God demonstrated in the perfect life of Jesus and his saving us and developing the new humanity, that same power God desires to be fully at work within you and me. Now, that may be something we choose and, 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 and affirm in our lives. Uh, some of that truth needs to percolate over days, maybe the rest of our lives, to really experience the full power of the event of Pentecost for each of us. Um, but it is also the event of creation. It is also the event of um, making humanity in the first place. It's the event of Christmas. It's the event of uh, Jesus' resurrection. It's this same extraordinary presence of God that's defined by his own spirit that can be in billions of places at once. That same spirit, that total presence of God to be within you and you and you and me, that we can really uh, grow in God, that we can become more and more like him, that we can follow through with his leadership in our lives. When he asks us to do something that we think we can't do, just say to him, Lord, I, thy will be done, now please empower me. And that empowerment may come right away. It may be something that requires study or work or, or you know, attending seminars or whatever, uh, or spending more time in prayer, or spending more time in meditating on God's Word. But be on that track. That's the Pentecostal track. That's the track that God wants the church to be on. There's a, a joke that goes like this. Uh, when Jesus ascended into heaven, which was about 10 days before Pentecost, the uh, angels asked Jesus, well, well, where's your church? What's going on down, down on earth? Jesus said, well, I, I put in the hands of some great people, some men and women. They're in prayer now in the, in the upper room, and, um, the, and I'm going to give them my spirit. And... Uh, one of the angels, one of the more talkative angels said to Jesus, okay, Lord, what's your, what's your backup plan? And Jesus said to the angel, I have no backup plan. That's the plan. And still is the plan. Isn't that awesome? There's one plan, that his spirit take charge in each of our lives and that we can experience his presence, which our name reminds us of, Emmanuel, God with us, and his empowerment, and his liberty to release every part of our lives to joyful celebration of his grace, of his wisdom, and of his personal presence. Amen? Let's pray. We thank you, God, for your awesome power in our lives. Just thank you that you do liberate us. Thank you that your power frees us from, from sin, that your power frees us from guilt, your power frees us from oppression. And thank you, Lord, that that power we can share also. We can be your representatives to free others from, from oppression, from guilt, from sin, free from legalism. Lord, help us to really 
uh, live in, in your joy, in your celebration, especially on this Pentecost Sunday today. May this be a, a turning point for each of us, Lord. However uh, advanced we are in affirming and experiencing and being uplifted and empowered by your Holy Spirit, take us, Lord, to the next level that we might be more fully filled, empowered, liberated by your Spirit. May we completely receive your Spirit and all that you desire to pour into us. May we live by your Spirit. And may we rejoice in the Spirit. May your presence change us. May your power give us courage. And may your joy exude in the way that we walk and think and talk and live. For your sake, we pray, on this Pentecost Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.